I've got a new camera that I'm trying out. It's called a laser camera. So <clears throat> I need to still kind of figure things out about it. But, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. I wanted to do a quick live stream uh, to do a couple of things, accomplish a few things. One is I wanted to present Lisa's 201-2 that I've been working on diligently for several weeks now. Um, I also wanted to uh, give you an update on my friend, uh, Andy Tube as well. And um, I was not aware of some recent developments with him that his health has taken another turn for the worse. Uh, but Susie out of Minnesota reached out to me and said, I know Andy and you are buddies. Uh, did you see his latest post? And uh, I had not. So it sounds like he's pretty much pulling the plug on things. And yes, he did that about a year or so ago. Uh, and then kind of stepped back and did some videos. But it sounds like he's kind of taking a final step away now, kind of taking a bow. So you'll want to check out his uh, his YouTube channel. And uh, and uh, he doesn't talk. He just does like a text uh, update summary of his transition and, you know, invites folks to watch his other videos and that. Um, and sadly, on his... Uh, his little video that he posted right now, he doesn't allow folks to post comments. And I think that's part of Andy's style. He likes uh, he likes to be a private guy. Remember, I tried to see about interviewing him. A number of you wanted me to see if I could interview Andy like I did with uh, Alex. And uh, Andy was just not open to that at all. So I think this is his way of, uh, of taking a bow at the end of his work. And uh, so just keep uh, he and his family in thought and prayer uh, as he obviously is taking a turn uh, down a path that he had hoped he would not have to take anytime soon. But that's the thing about cancer, isn't it? Cancer is uh, one of those things that can it can drop off of the, the radar and you think you're free and clear. And then all of a sudden it rears its ugly head again. So uh Anyway, long and short, keep Andy in thought and prayer, if you would, please. Uh, now, before I jump into Lisa's machine over here, which is behind the camera, I'll point out this machine over here as well, which you really can't see much of, can you? I'll let you grab the camera. I think I'll be able to reach a little ways over, probably not very far. So this, this machine over here is obviously a, a Singer 101, and it's a 101-4. It was the first in the potted motor series that Singer really ever came out with. It was the predecessor by almost 15 years uh, to the Singer 201-2 that I'm going to be showing you today that I prepared for Lisa. Um, they're both great machines, uh, but they're also very 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 different machines from the standpoint of how they're set up the 101 for example when you're setting it up you're going to be uh, setting it up with the flat side of the needle to the right the threading of the needle is from left to right and the bobbin turn is going to be counterclockwise the machine that i'm going to be showing you today that i prepared for lisa the 201-2 is 180 degrees opposite when you're setting the needle you're going to set the flat side to the left you're threading the needle from right to left and the bobbin turn is going to be clockwise and this is the machine that i'm talking about right here Let's see if we can't get a little bit closer So most of you are going to be very, very familiar with this, with this particular machine. Kind of watching, I've got a customer arriving shortly as well from Illinois. Thank you. 
So you've seen this machine a lot on this channel, uh, the 201-2. It comes with a potted style motor. You can see it on the back here. Which means instead of having a belt on this machine, it's going to be gear to gear uh, direct drive. That's a huge, huge benefit when it comes to uh, the machine being able to have positive traction and launch through some very, very difficult sew offs. And when it comes to the 201 2, it's going to come with either a standard 0.5 amp motor or a point six amp motor kind of watching out the workshop window here i've got uh a young lady that's traveling up from illinois and she may have gotten turned around she should have been here by now so i decided to kind of launch into this You guys have to give me feedback on this uh, this new camera, how it seems to be uh, focusing and everything. It's my first time using it. I've got all kinds of sew-offs that I want to try to do, <clears throat> try to do on this uh, machine. Oh, hi, Cynthia. Cynthia is uh, is here along with, uh, I think that's Michelle. So you sold bags, huh, Cynthia? Very cool. Yeah, the 201-2 is a great machine for sewing bags. I don't know what kind of bags you're making. But I would guess with some of your bags, you're probably using leather similar to this. This is vegetable tan leather. And I love sewing this stuff. It's got a nice flat nap on the back. So even if I'm doing a single layer of it, I'm able to see uh, the stitching on the back of it quite well. But we're going to be doing two layers of it to kind of just launch into the, uh, the live stream with this machine. Does anyone know when the 201-2 was first introduced? Cynthia said she has one and she uses for, uses it for making bags. Does anyone know when the uh, the 201 dash two was first introduced? And if you want to try to get bonus points, tell me when its predecessor on the other workbench I showed you over there, the 101 that belongs to my dear friend Mary from Washington State. Also, both of these machines are going to be heading back to Washington State eventually, but. Uh, Tell me when the 101 came on the scene and when the 201-2 came on the scene to replace it. That would be kind of cool. If you know. So just for fun, we're going to buzz down. And I say for fun because a lot of people would be shocked that you can do it so easily. But I'm going to be sewing down two layers of vegetable tan leather. And we're just going to be laying down a standard straight stitch on this 201-2 let's see how it does once i get my foot all the way on the foot controller all right here we go oh yeah very nice very very nice add a little bit more presser foot pressure i could feel that that was feeding a little bit unevenly and remember that simple rule when you're sewing leather or any other heavy type material you want to make sure that you have enough presser foot pressure that really is going to drive the train not just as far as feeding the material but it's also going to drive the train as far as 
how easily those stitches can stay uniform. Let's do this again. I just bumped up the pressure foot pressure a little bit more. Oh yeah, I can already feel. I can already feel that that's, that's riding so much easier through there now. Yeah, a little bit hard to see against this light material, but And if you don't sew with vegetable tan leather very often, it's a real slippery, kind of like Italian leather. It tends to be a little bit on the slipperier side. So using that pressure foot pressure bump up is even more important when you're sewing with this type of material. I'm going to set that to the side. Now let's go the opposite direction. Let's buzz down some of this 100% uh, cotton. And this is some of my cotton. It's um, it's off of a fat quarter that I picked up locally. And then it's got a stiffener in between here. You can see that. Adds a lot of uh, stability to it when you're trying to lay down stitches on super thin cotton like this. So let's give this a try. And I'm just going to back off that presser foot pressure just a little bit so that we don't get bunching on this. Oh yeah, very, very nice. Let's see if shutting that off helps. Yeah, that does help a little bit. So the thing about the 201-2 is with its rotary hook system, it's able to manage a wide field of sew-offs without making any drastic changes to that upper tension. Uh, we went through two layers of vegetable tan leather and then quickly shifted over to 100% cotton. No adjustment to the uh, tension whatsoever. And we still delivered a beautiful page 34 top stitch and also the lock stitch that you can see here. Let's see if I can get a little bit closer on that. This camera does seem to adjust a little bit quicker as far as its focus, doesn't it? Those of you that are used to me using uh, the other camera, where it kind of really struggles in getting that focus sometimes, this one seems to really jump on it pretty quick. Plus, it's got some sort of a lighting thing on it as well. Let me see if I can turn that on. So beautiful stitching so far with this 201-2. Uh, We've got a lot more sew-offs to do, a lot more sew-offs. And I didn't look at the chat. Did anyone guess when the 201-2 was first introduced? Let me take a look real quick. It looks like Emma took a stab at it. Uh, she was saying the 101 came on the scene in 1920, which is absolutely correct. But the 101 was actually on the scene longer than 1932. Uh, it actually was on the scene until 1937. So the 101 had an overlap with the 201-2 coming on the scene right around 1935. It had a two-year overlap where both machines were still being produced. Both machines were still on the scene together. The 101 was on the way out. The 201-2 was on the way in. And uh, the result is we got even a better uh, potted version of uh, this great machine when the 201-2 came on the scene in 1935. How long was the 201, this machine, how, how long was this in production? Does anyone know? When did the 201 go out of production? No, you're right, Emma. 201 came on the scene in 1935. Nineteen thirty-five. Yeah. I'm gonna try to get even closer here. Oh, there we go.
Well, if you don't know the answer to that last question, the 201-2 was produced until right around 1961. So it had a really, really good long run, didn't it? And uh, certainly would have been even on the scene longer, but Singer was developing so many new machines at that time. All right, let's go down this one more time. I just want to see how that feeding is going. All right, here we go. I just shut off that. Uh, see what that happens when that LED light is on? It's really goofy, isn't it? So as you look at the stitching, the first one we had a little bit lighter on the presser foot pressure. I made another adjustment. We did this second row, and the spacing and the formation is absolutely spot on. But presser foot pressure is so critical, not just as far as feeding the material, but also maintaining stitch integrity as well. I've had a number of people contact me, and they thought that they had another thing going on with their machine, and with a simple adjustment, to the presser foot pressure, uh, we were able to resolve some stitch quality issues that they had battled for quite some time. So that's always, it's always great to overcome problems, isn't it? Sometimes you're looking at one thing as a potential problem or, solu or a solution and it's something totally different. So beautiful, beautiful stitching. Very, very pleased with that. 100% cotton again. And, uh, Let's keep on plugging along, see what we do. Oh, hey, I'll just say hello to a couple of folks real quick. Hello to Cynthia. And uh, I think that says Sheila. I'm kind of looking a distance away at the screen. So if I got that wrong, sorry about that. And uh, Susie from uh, Minnesota. And Michelle and Emma. I'm not sure who FTF is, but welcome to FTF. And uh, Sheila is saying that her 201 takes off too fast, almost no control of starting speed. Suggestions. Well, there is a way to calibrate the foot controller, uh, Sheila, if I'm saying your first name correctly. I hope I am. Um, inside of the foot controller, I'll kind of reach down and grab this one. Inside of the foot controller, when you open it up, there is a, an adjustment screw on this end that can be turned in or turned out to increase or decrease the sensitivity. In other words, how far you push this button down in order to uh, get a response from the foot controller. The thing you have to be careful about, again, when you're adjusting a foot controller and, and calibrating it for sensitivity, is you've got to be careful that you don't adjust it too far in because it'll leave the circuit open on the foot controller and it could cause the uh, foot controller to, to overheat. But when you open up the foot controller, you take out these four screws right here and take it out. Obviously, don't have the machine plugged in. But when you take it out, there's going to be an adjuster. It's going to look like a little um, copper uh, band on the opposite end of where the leads connect to the foot controller. And then you can in your case, it sounds like it's too sensitive. You can turn that counterclockwise a few turns and see whether or not that works works out better for you. But yeah, 201s, uh, they do tend to have a quick launch to them. They do tend to launch fairly quick. And uh, depending on the type of sewing you're looking to do, uh, that can be really awkward for, for maintaining control, can't it? 
So let's do some more sewing with this machine. All right. I think I'm going to do some of this uh, saddle grade leather. Let's give this a try. There's so many different types of leather. Uh, and for any of you that are using your tool 1-2 to make bags, etc., cetera, uh, you probably deal with a wide variety of different leathers in your work. And they all react a little bit differently when it comes to when it comes to uh, the stitching that you're looking to lay down on it. And also the setup that you have on the machine as well plays a big factor. What kind of needle you decide to put into the machine, is it gonna be, if you're working a lot with leather, is it gonna be a straight leather needle, which is gonna have a very different scarf and point and uh, shaft on it? Or are you gonna go with a universal needle like I have in here today, a size 9014? And, um, you know, again, it gives you a little bit more flexibility in going between leather and other types of materials as well, where you might be doing different types of projects. So you don't want to keep switching out the, uh, the needles and such. But um, the quality of stitching can really be a factor. Uh, also, the needle, the thread you're choosing. Uh, the thread I have on this machine set up today is a general Coates and Clark uh, dual duty type thread. Got it at Joanne Fabrics. Gives you quite a bit of flexibility in the type of sewing that you're going to use use it for. I've got some quilters that use it regularly. And I've got uh, some people that are bag makers that use it as well. So it really is going to kind of depend on uh, your likes and preferences and, and what you're trying to accomplish with your project. So see that. Is that better? So let's go ahead and buzz down this now. This is uh, two layers of saddle grade leather. Saddle grade leather is a little bit more of a dense uh, type nap. It's going to be used for heavier type uh, sewing projects with leather. It, you might be using it uh, on the real heavy side for gun holsters. You might be using it for uh, different horse applications. Uh, I don't think they use it too much for saddles anymore, but it gives you a lot of flexibility in the type of sewing. So let's give this a try. Let's see how this 201 launches into this. And I'm not doing any hand starts with the machine. We're just jumping into it. Let's see how it does. So we're going through probably about about six to eight ounces of leather right now. No hand start. And if you've got a 201-2 uh, that isn't able to handle this level of sewing, it's probably relating to the potted motor. Um, as you'll see in the progress shots that I did on this machine, found a lot of issues with the wiring inside of this potted motor. And it was really impacting and stealing uh, the power of this machine dramatically. So again, about six to eight ounces of saddle grade leather. Look at that from the side what we just went through. Absolute ease, no struggle, no hand start, equally beautiful lock stitch uh, as well.
So again, if you've got a 201-2 and it's not able to handle eight ounces of saddle grade leather, or maybe even lighter than that, consider bringing it or sending it to the workshop so I can take care of the motor on it. Matter of fact, we'll look at some of those progress shots shortly. Get an idea when you look at the side of that, what we just went through, just crazy. Set that over there too. I've got so many different so offs that we can do during this premiere, it's just insane. I really wanted to concentrate on the leather side because a lot of people will get 201-2s with the idea of using it for leather. Here's some, uh, genuine elk hide maybe we'll do a little bit of uh our friend uh sheila i think it was was talking about her 201-2 not having a lot of control so let's see if we can do this uh genuine elk hide now and what i'm going to try to do is stitch around the edges of it all the way around got a little bit of a bend up there and we'll see if we can demonstrate when a foot controller is calibrated well, you're going to have fairly good control with a 201-2. So let's try that right now, see what we think. Really slowing it down. Get to that edge. We're navigating some pretty tight turns here, and I'm able to meter out that power. See how slow I'm able to sew right now? So the 201-2, you can harness that power back, but that foot controller really plays an important factor in that, doesn't it? So if you've got a 201-2 that just launches with a lot of gusto and you're having trouble harnessing it back, try my suggestion in getting that uh, foot controller calibrated. Get that foot controller calibrated and it'll give you a lot more flexibility. So our setup again <coughs> today is uh, Coates and Clark general purpose type thread. See if I can hold it like this and actually give us even a better visual on it. And what we just sewed on right here is 100% elk hide. Elk hide is a, a chemically processed leather. It's a challenging leather to sew because of the, the density and the weave of it. Uh, it's tough stuff to get through. Here's our lock stitch on the back here. Let me clip these threads real quick. Looks like I sewed over my thread too. So you can see when we're looking at the lock stitch, you really have to kind of pull it back on this because of that... Uh, 
the nap on this uh, elk hide is really, really thick stuff. But we've got a really, really good looking lock stitch as well. So this sew off was not so much to show the power of the machine. It's got a huge amount of power now, but it's also to show you that the, uh, the control factor and being able to slow the machine down for more strategic type sewing, more targeted sewing. Beautiful stitching. What else are we going to sew? That's true. I could do that. This is more of that elk hide right here. And here we could go strictly for power. See if we can do two layers of this back to back. See what two layers looks like on this uh, 201 dash 2? That is the equivalent of a man's belt easily. You think that this machine can handle a sew off like this? We're not using a leather needle. We're not using a heavier gauge type thread. We're using a, a basic Coates and Clark dual duty type thread. That's crazy thickness right there. You can see it in the shot. Can I do this on a machine like this? Let's give it a try. I already know the answer to that, but let's give it a try anyway. One of the things is make sure your take-up arm is at the highest position when you launch on something like this. I'm going to try doing this without a hand start. All right. Keep your fingers crossed. Again, a size 9014 Schmetz Universal Needle and uh, Coates and Clark dual duty thread going through the equivalent of probably about 10 to 12 ounces of genuine elk hide. This will be tough. This will be very, very tough, but we'll see how we do. Here we go. No hand start, folks. No hand start. Not all 201-2s would be able to handle a sew-off like this, folks. There's no way. See how I'm kind of off? I'm like part on the material, part not on. So we might skid out a little bit when I launch. We might skid just a little bit. All right, here we go. We did skid a little bit. That was kind of fun. Yeah, you can see the skid mark right here. <clears throat> this shows you again where, where traction and feed is so essential right here as we were launching. Let me move that camera down a little bit. Right here is where we were starting to launch and I was like part, part of the way off of the material and the presser foot was is pitched up a little bit. We didn't have good traction, and so our stitch length here dropped dramatically from the other stitch length that you'll see around the material. Beautiful stitching, except for my little skid point.
but we knew that was going to happen. We knew that was going to happen. So this again, you talk about the thick of thick. That's what we just went through right there. That's our lock stitch on the back. Also equally gorgeous stitching. And the lock stitch, especially when you're going through this much leather. Look at, again, the thickness of the leather we went through. The lock stitch is always going to be a more, more of a challenge for the machine to, uh, to execute that well. Because it's got to pull that Coates and Clark dual-duty thread all the way back through those two thicknesses of elk hide and get that stitch to really be finished beautifully and it did it and that's with a non-leather needle a non-leather needle i don't know about you but that's impressive to me to have a machine like this that has such a reserve of power that it's able to go through the equivalent of a very thick belt and lay down page 34 stitching. Beautiful, beautiful stitching all the way around. We could probably stop right now. Look at what we've already done, just goofing around. Just goofing around. We've already done all of this on this live stream so far. We did 100% cotton with a stiffener. We did uh, two layers of this uh, elk hide. We did the saddle grade leather. We did two layers of saddle grade leather. And then we did this uh, veg tan leather as well. I mean, that is, that's a little bit of a sewing Olympics right there that we've already done. But we're not done yet. We've got more fun to have, right? You got to have a little bit more fun. <coughs> So type in the chat if we're if we're setting this machine up to sew which way is the flat side of the needle going to go on this 201-2 what what direction does the flat side of the needle go on this you know it's the opposite of the 101 the 101 that's on the other workbench that belongs to my friend Mary from Washington state we're going to set that up 180 degrees different so tell me about the flat side on this machine. And uh, also, how do you thread it? Do you thread it from left to right, right to left? Well, if you said, when you set up this 201-2 that belongs to Lisa, from the great state of Washington. Isn't it fun to have two machines on the workbenches right now? And both of them are going to be heading back to Washington State. But remember on the 201-2 that the flat side of the needle when you set it up has to go to the left. Whereas the 101 on the other workbench, you're going to be putting the flat side to the right. So flat side to the left, and then you're going to be threading the needle from right to left on this uh, Singer 201-2. So if you have two of these machines, just be mindful of that because your setup is going to be very, very different between these two machines. That thread actually came out a little bit. I just saw that we have this extra thread guide right here and the thread had popped out of there. I may have to pinch that down a little bit because depending on the level of sewing that you're doing, it can work that thread around quite a bit more, can't it? Quite a bit more. Well, and you can't see it in the shot, but I see that Chrissy 
Is it Chrissy or Christy? Hold on a second. <clears throat> Christy just showed up amid this live stream. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, Christy from Illinois. I can see her out the workshop window. She literally just pulled in. She literally just pulled in. So let me put on some music. You guys kind of hang tight for a second. Let me raise this up a little bit so you can look at these two great machines together. All right, y'all hang tight for a second. I've got to let Chris, uh, Christy in, and then we'll wrap up with a couple more sew-offs, and then we'll, because uh, she's dropping off a machine. Hold on a second, you guys. Watch your step. It's a, it's a little bit narrow through here. There's the foot controller. Okay, so you got an electric one. Electric yeah, electronic. that like I said, that was retrofitted. I'm only the second owner. But, sure. Um, and then I've just got other accessories. Let me show the machine that. Christy came up from Rockford, Illinois, and this is what she brought in. Does anyone recognize this model? Recognize that model? Do you mind if I show you? No, I mean, well, I don't know that they'd be interested, but look, I've got the original sales, 1955, lifetime guarantee. It's um, crazy, isn't it? Yeah. It's just so where would cool. you ever get where would you ever get a lifetime warranty these days? No kidding, right? But anyway, so it's just there's a lot of sort of original um, stuff that I got with it. We've got the original buff glass like oil bottle. Oh, is that cool? It's actually etched in there, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. You can read it on the glass, and then here's the original little oil can. Oh my gosh, is that cute? I have no idea if they'd actually, if I'd use them, but I'm certainly not going to get rid of them. Aren't they, darling? Isn't that cool? Can you see it? Yeah, yeah. This thing focuses really, really well. Cool. How many hours did it take you to get up here? Three and a half. Three and a half hours? Yeah, okay. yeah and it was an easy drive. Yeah, yeah. So, no problem there. And goodies. then they're just, yeah. you know, they're presser foots, and I just grabbed everything because I wasn't sure, sure, sure what would be helpful to you. But um, Brilliant. it was working when I purchased it. Sure. And then I got it home and I was just fiddling with it. And it just isn't actually sewing. Like the feed dog part, okay. I can wind a bobbin. You know, the electronics and so forth seem to be working fine. But it just doesn't want to actually sew. I'm not even seeing any feed dog movement right now. Right. It's right. like it's uh it's it's frozen, isn't it? It would seem to be. And like I said, it was working when I got it. So whatever's wrong is a fairly recent development. Okay, and it hasn't been dropped or anything. No. 
Okay. I asked because there was a machine similar to this. It came from Indiana and they had it on a table that was a little bit wobbly in the kitchen and it took a tumble off of there. Oh dear. No, this is actually, I obviously didn't bring it, but I've got the original, um, uh, what am I trying to say? Desk. Sewing cabinet. The yeah, original sewing cabinet. The table the, and everything. Yeah, sure. the table, everything, even the, um, even the original chair. <laughs> what? I know. It's Holy crazy. Holy mackerel. So I just, if, if we can bring it back to life, I would be so happy. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. I've never encountered a machine that we couldn't fix, so. Oh, that's very encouraging. Yeah, Terrific. yeah. All right, well, um, do I leave you my info? What do I do now? Yeah, yeah, let me write down your, I've got your phone number already, don't I? Yes, you do. Okay, yeah, so let me write that down. Make sure that we've got the tag on there. Let's kind of see what's in that is just beautiful. That is, uh, that's actually what we're featuring today on the live stream. It's, uh, it's a two hundred one dash two that was introduced. You guys remember? We already went over this. <laughs> introduced in nineteen thirty five, right? Oh wow! And it took over for this machine over here on the other workbench, the one hundred one that was introduced back in nineteen twenty. They're both potted style motors. But uh, beautiful, yeah. Oh, fun. Singer has been a busy, busy person. So let's see here. Now you go by Christy, right? Yeah, like Christmas with a Y. Okay. S T O T T. Okay, perfect. I'll write down your number. We're not going to do that on the live stream, obviously. Thank you. <laughs> Starts getting calls. Hey, Christy, you made it at the Scott's workshop. Hey, she's going, thanks a lot, Scott. Great. Edit, actually, edit, edit. <laughs> if I'm just hearing from other like, sewing enthusiasts, that actually doesn't sound so bad. <laughs> oh, my gosh. And did you, uh, did you come prepared to leave a deposit for this? Yes. Okay. Yes. Brilliant. All right. We'll just we set, discuss that. So. We'll set. Okay, you guys, I'm going to, I've got all of Christy's stuff. So wish Christy a safe journey back to Rockford, Illinois. Thank you. Wait, come on. There she is. Hey. <laughs> I'm really excited about being here. Thank you. <laughs> and then we'll finish our live stream on this machine. So Perfect. I've got all your info and everything. Yeah, yeah, That's absolutely. Brilliant. Um, and yeah, just stay in touch. Just let me know. Let me know what you find out. And actually, even my contact information is on. I just realized the name's on box. So you can oh, get perfect. address. Okay, perfect. Some of this could be kind of fun to look at. Awesome. Awesome. So thank you. I gotta give you a oh. gift to take with. Oh. Yes. Nothing, nothing fancy. Let me give you a card too. Yeah, let me Thanks go. so much. Yeah, let me go upstairs with you, and then I'll come back and I'll finish my live stream on this machine. Thanks everybody for your patience. Yeah, I, that's a the one on the right is actually a pretty pretty tool. Yeah, it's a this is a this looks identical. That's gonna be really close. Yeah, and this is the same type. Yep, three three two. I think that's a. This is going to be the 230. That's what you got, right? Yeah. Yeah, so this is like yours on the left. Uh -huh. Yeah, they're going to have a lot of the same, a lot of the same attributes. Oh, sure. Wow, they should be able to. It's terrifying to drop them, but. But you were crinkling that thing like, hey, I got you. I got you.
Okay, I'm back. Thank you, everybody, for your patience. Hopefully, you were engaged in chat and conversation with each other while I was taking care of Christy. <clears throat> so, yeah, this is the machine again that just arrived. Christy brought it up from Rockford, Illinois. It's a FOF Model 230. I think, I think we've seen this. I've got this on the channel. I know I do. And she said it initially was working, but now you see with the balance wheel movement, we're not getting any feed dog movement at all. Something is jammed up. So we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. All right, back to the live stream. Thank you for your patience again. I didn't know if she was going to make it today, so I decided to launch into this live stream so we could take care of this 201. And, uh, and then Christy uh, popped in a little bit late, which is fine. All right, let me look at the chat real quick. Hello to Stephen. Hey, Stephen. <clears throat> and Kevin and Doreen. And uh, I think I've said hello to everybody else. If, if I missed anyone, uh, please, please accept my apology for that. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. What should we sew next? Why don't we do some of this bubblegum material? And if you're new to this channel and you're saying, why do you call this stuff bubblegum material? Check this out. This stuff is just ridiculously stretchy, ridiculously stretchy. And I think what we'll do is we'll go a long run on this one. I'm going to go ahead and get in underneath the presser foot. We'll do a long run on this. And I think I'll do a, I'll do a row of stitching that's going to be right around six or seven stitches per inch. And then we'll do a, a much tighter satin type level stitch on it, closer to about 20 stitches per inch. We'll see how this uh machine is able to manage the feed of this material. This material tends to be really tricky to feed uh, because of its elasticity. Let's get right over to there. And as you're looking at this machine, um, you can tell that it's not a full restore. Um, really what, uh, what Lisa was looking for and actually got the 201-2 and then also a uh, a 99k for me at the same time uh she's looking for machines that can be a workhorse for her so i did some general cleanup on the paint but nothing fancy so it's not going to be like a, a brand new museum quality machine but it's got a lot of character doesn't it all right so let's give this a try two layers of this bubblegum material let's see what we think of the stitching on this stuff this is tricky stuff all right here we go That is gorgeous stitching. Oh my gosh. I still have to cut my threads. What about our lock stitch? How's our lock stitch looking? Actually, it looks a little bit overly poppy, doesn't it? Let me give these threads a clip and we can take a little bit closer look at it. You know what I could do, too, is I can just launch right into that. Let's make adjustment on here. And if you don't know the lay of the land on the 201, it's actually really, really simple. This is our stitch length controller right here. All the way down, you're going to get the largest stitch, right around six or seven stitches per inch. And then as we move it up, we're going to be getting into that 
15 to 20 stitch range. I'll probably leave it right around there. If we want to sew in reverse, we just push it all the way to the top, like so. So let's get it back down in the range right around. Right around there, I think, is what we'll go with. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, any machine that can handle this bubblegum material is able to handle any material that I throw in front of it. Just beautiful stitching. And this stuff, because it has a vinyl factor to it, you can just tell straight away that it, it is a, a material that could easily manipulate um, the needle and uh, can cause skip stitching. Well, you can see we just got gorgeous stitching all the way down. That's our lock stitch. Yeah, I kind of like this new camera. This thing is doing a good job so far. So now let's put it to the test and see how it does with shortening that stitch up a lot. See if we get a, a similar result. Beautiful stitching. All right, let's do this. Take up arms are already the highest position. Now let's cut that stitch length down dramatically and see if the machine can still manage stitch integrity and stitch quality. Here we go. Slow it down, slow it way down. Well, that's a little bit of a dramatic contrast, isn't it? That's a little bit of a dramatic contrast. And the machine managed that beautifully, beautifully. We maintain stitch integrity with the top stitch. And again, I'm, I am inclined to say, there's our lock stitch on the back. I'm actually inclined to say that our upper tension is a little bit on the high end right now. Look at this lock stitch down into the satin range now. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then we flip it over. Not quite as much definition on that top stitch. So if we were sewing a bunch of this, what would we do if we wanted to make the top stitch a little bit more poppy? What would we do? How do we make that adjustment? It's a good looking top stitch, but to give it, give it even more pop, what adjustment do we do on the machine? Does anybody know? What adjustment do we do? Got all that extra space there. <coughs> Excuse me. So Susie is saying, if we want to give a little bit more poppiness to that top stitch, what we're going to do is we're going to back off, <coughs> excuse me, we're going to back off this upper tension just slightly. Is she right? Because if I back this off, right now we're on a little bit below five. We back that off just a little bit, say just to a little bit above four, like so. Will that give us the result that we're looking for? Let's see. Let's see. I think Susie's very smart, and I think she's right. So I just, <coughs> excuse me. The air has been so cold. It's really messing around with my throat. Let me grab some water real quick. Here we go. All right, let's see what result we can bring by making that simple little adjustment. If it's going to give us a little bit more of a poppy 
top stitch. Yeah, I like that. You look at the two rows, <coughs> excuse me, side by side. We've got a little bit better sti stitch definition now with that second row that we just did compared to the first one. It's giving a little bit more of a poppiness factor. And I probably didn't go as far as I could have. That's our lock stitch on the back right there. We still have really good definition on that lock stitch in the second row that we did. <coughs> so... We could have even gone maybe a little bit further than I did. I only made a, <coughs> excuse me, a very modest adjustment. But Susie was absolutely spot on. When you're trying to get more of a pronounced top stitch, you've got to sometimes back off that upper tension just a little bit. Now, we could have also gone down to the bobbin case and adjusted that up a little bit as too. We could have gone to the bobbin case and just adjusted it up slightly and that would have given us the same result but it's so much easier <coughs> excuse me to work with the upper tension because it's it's available to us straight away isn't it we don't have to remove the bobbin case or do anything like that so some really good results so kudos to Susie good job in helping us to get a little bit better defined stitch on that second row. Yeah, I like it. Yeah, very, very nice. <coughs> Excuse me. So, so far, So far in the live stream, that was actually off camera. Hundred percent cotton, and on the live stream, hundred percent cotton again. Hundred percent elkide, genuine elkide, I should say. <coughs> Excuse me, two layers of genuine elkide. Saddle grade leather. That in and of itself is kind of crazy, but <coughs> excuse me, veg <coughs> excuse me, vegetable tan leather. And then finally this bubblegum material as well. So that's what a sew-off sandwich looks like when you're doing a live stream. And I know that there are other channels where people will do a very high-level test of a machine and consider the deal done. But I firmly believe you've got to run the machine through, <coughs> excuse me, a diverse field of sew-offs that that customer is likely to be able to do on their own when they get the machine in so that they've got the confidence that it's going to get the job done. So that's why I do a lot of the extra sew-offs. Just done a bunch of heavy duty. Why don't we do some of this Kona cotton now? This, again, is something that Paula Noel prepared for me, a number of these little Kona cotton-type uh, sew-off, uh, little, um, little sew-offs, for lack of a better description. So we've got quilt batting, quilt batting uh, in the middle with two very thin layers of Kona cotton on either side of it. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, let's give this a go. I'm going to back off that presser foot pressure just a little bit on top so that we're not going to get as much bunching up when we're trying to feed this hopefully i should also use my clips shouldn't i i'll use my monster clips to kind of hold this together a little bit i 
Let's see what we think of this as far as sew off. And I did move my stitch length back to a regular size stitch at this point. All right, let's give this a try. So again, good control, good control when that foot controller is calibrated well. We were able to take that at a fairly slow rate. And I'm not a cotton expert, but uh, those of you that are hardcore quilters have probably heard of Kona cotton before. It's kind of like the Cadillac of cottons. And it does a beautiful job when it comes to preserving that stitch integrity, doesn't it? Straight stitching is what quilters are all about. <coughs> Excuse me. Straight stitching is what quilters are all about. Kind of hard to see that light against the light, isn't it? Let's try this. Yes. Try it from this angle, I think is better. There we go. I just turned that other light back on again. Lighting is such a challenge, isn't it, sometimes? Lighting can be such a challenge when you're trying to show things on camera. Especially when you're dealing with a light thread and a light material, isn't it? Kind of a challenge. I think we've got a pretty good angle now. There we go. That's a little bit better, isn't it? A little bit easier to see. All right, I'm going to make you guys crazy if I keep trying to show that to you. You get the idea. All right, let's buzz down this one more time. And again, we're going to reduce that stitch length dramatically and see what impact we can bring, if any, to uh, the stitch quality on this uh, Kona cotton. should probably put my little clips back on, shouldn't I? All right. So 100% Kona cotton, we're sewing with a 9014 Schmetz Universal Needle using Coates and Clark Dual Duty Thread. Let me get this, get this a little bit closer so you can watch it as it's laying the stitches down. I'm getting like a scrolling across there. I don't know if you're seeing that or not.
All right, let's give this a try. Here we go. Really going to slow it down. And see, we didn't make any adjustments on that upper tension since our last adjustment. And we're getting a really nice looking top stitch now. Very nice looking top stitch. Some reason it has it has trouble when I get at certain angles with this camera, but overall it's doing a good job. <coughs> so there you can see. It maintained beautiful stitch integrity, even as we brought that stitch down to about 15 to 20 stitches per inch on this Kona cotton. And again, we've gone already through crazy thicknesses of leather. We've gone through the lighter side of cotton, and the machine has managed all of those sew-offs with absolute ease and with absolute page 34 stitch integrity. So beautiful, beautiful stitching there. That would be a, that would be a stitch that, <coughs> excuse me, any quilter, any quilter could be proud of. Let's flip it over and look at the other side. Equally gorgeous stitching. The integrity, the spacing, the presentation of the stitch is exactly, exactly as it should be. So, you know, if anyone says that a 201-2 can't sew the lighter side of things just as well as the heavy side, we pretty much know about the heavy side. This is proof that you can go between cotton and leather without changing the needle, without changing the thread, only making a very modest upper tension adjustment to get a little bit more of a top stitch out of it. And the result is you're getting some gorgeous, gorgeous stitching. Gorgeous stitching. Reality Bites, that's a cute name. Welcome to Reality Bites. Reality Bites. I wonder if they're into real estate. What do you think? <clears throat> so, yeah, I'm really pleased with that. I'll leave the rest of this space open for Lisa if she wants to goof around on this Kona cotton. But that's the type of results that we're looking for. Exactly the type of results we're looking for right there. Beautiful stitching. Beautiful, beautiful stitching. All right, let me set this to the side. Now we're going to go from the light side back to the heavy side again. <clears throat> and since I haven't done it for a while, I thought I would show you guys a little bit of this commercial upholstery material. A little bit of this commercial upholstery material. All right, so I've got two layers of this to start with. Let's go ahead and fold it in half. Get us up to four layers. Let's fold it again. I think that might be a little bit insane. I think that's a little bit on the crazy side right there. But part of the premiere is doing crazy, outrageous things, right? <clears throat> so let's try this. Somebody can get in the presser foot. So 
So what we have here is basically eight layers of commercial upholstery material. And we're going to do our best to see if this 201-2, without a hand start, can navigate through this sew-off. This is probably the toughest sew-off that we're about to try to pull off. This would even scare some upholsters, I have no doubt. All right, let me raise this up a little bit. That way you can see that I, <coughs> excuse me, you can see that I'm not going to cough so bad that I have to end the live stream. Ah. Weather changes can just play havoc on your voice, can't they? All right. So here we've got eight layers of commercial upholstery material. We're going to see if this tool 1-2 can pull this off as well. And again, we've got a, a fairly quickly tiring needle. A needle that's done a lot of sew-offs already. But we're going to see if we can just pull this one off as well. All right. No hand start. Here we go. Fingers and toes crossed. Here we go. Ah! I'm trying to get my foot on the foot controller. Hold on. I'm almost there. I've got to get it. Hold on. Hold on a second. <coughs> that was easy. That was easy. That was easy. That was easy. <laughs> Eight layers of commercial upholstery material. Are you kidding me? Wait until you see this thickness again. I'm trying to get close enough with the busyness of the material that you can see how gorgeous those stitches are, too. <coughs> Excuse me. It's not just that we got through the material, but we laid down page 34 stitching on it on to, to boot. So. That is really busy material to look at, isn't it? It's just crazy. All right. That was crazy enough, right? That was insane. Let's do something even crazier now. We're going to do the same sew off one more time. Let's try this. All right, let's try this one more time. <clears throat> but this time we're going to lay down a satin level stitch through all of this commercial upholstery material. Let's do that. All 
already again no hand start no hand start just the the sheer grit of this 201-2 all right here we go i'm going to take it nice and slow too If you have any idea how easy this machine is looking like it's doing that, which it is, and how difficult that is, it's making it look like it's absolutely a laugh. And yet we just went through eight layers of commercial upholstery material with a satin level stitch. Oh my gosh, that's gorgeous. I'm hoping you'll be able to see this. It's just real right over here. Look at that stitching. It's absolutely a page 34 stitch, both rows, but this satin level stitch is just off the, it's off the hook. And look at what we went through again. There, it's really coming into focus well. Look at that. Oh, my gosh. I don't know what to say other than <coughs> there's probably less than 1%, 1% 201s in the world that could handle a sew-off like this laying down the stitch quality that it did it's not an easy task not an easy task at all and yet lisa's machine just made it look like it was a hiccup just made it look like it was absolutely a laughable sew off so look at this so far excuse me, 100% cotton uh, off camera, 100% cotton on camera, 100% Kona cotton on camera, saddle grade leather, actually correction, that's genuine Elkhide, that's Elkhide, more Elkhide, two layers of this stuff, Saddle grade leather. Vegetable tan leather. That one's tough to see because of how light the material is in relation to the thread, but. There you can kind of see it. <clears throat> bubble gum material and finally the last sew off we just did a hundred percent uh commercial upholstery material eight layers of that with this 201-2 everything from a standard stitch all the way down to the satin range about 20 stitches per inch without missing a beat without a single skip stitch just delivering at the top of its game so i mean that's what a sew off sandwich looks like that's what a true test of a machine to know that it's ready to go to work for my customer has to look like. There's no other, there's no other way to do it. There's just no other way to do it. What do I have left? Anything? I've got some protected full grain leather. I've got some Italian leather. I haven't done sewing around in a circle yet. That would be fun. <coughs> 
Actually, you know what I'll do too? Is I'll do some more precision sewing to show that you can harness the power of this workhorse of a 201-2 down to a manageable rate. All right, let's sew around this, <coughs> excuse me, protected full grain leather. We're going to see if we can really hug it close to the edges and harness this power back as we do what probably is going to be the final sew off. So I have this kind of an odd shaped cutout of this protected full grain leather. Let's see if this machine can handle this last sew off as well as it's handled everything else. There we go. All right, here we go. Final sew off, probably. And we'll see if it can handle this from a control standpoint and regulating speed. Here we go. And for the box closers, I even closed the box. <laughs> oh, that is some beautiful stitching. And you saw how I was having to really, really manhandle that uh, protected full grain leather just to kind of maneuver it as we were trying to stitch around the, those edges. Didn't have to stop, but I had to slow down quite a bit, didn't I? I had to slow down quite a bit. All right, let's take a look at this stitching. Excuse me. Folks, I didn't know what you can see with this new camera, but that is some absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous stitching. Some absolutely gorgeous stitching from top all the way down to bottom. And we were able to do that and make turns like that because this machine also has the ability to really, really harness that power back and, and really be a, a precision machine, not just a workhorse. Workhorses imply that the machine can blast through things, but it doesn't always imply precision and calculation. But we just demonstrated that right now with this sew off. And as we turn it over, let's look at the lock stitch as well, which is just absolutely as it should be. Absolutely as it should be.
This is kind of fun to turn it like this, isn't it? Well, you get the idea. Well, folks, that is some gorgeous, gorgeous stitching, both the top and the lock stitch as well. So let's let's sum up again what we've done on this live stream to put this machine to the test. We did this protected full grain leather. Let me set this camera down. We just did this protected full grain leather and lay down some absolutely drop dead gorgeous stitching. <coughs> This was off camera. Let me set that over there. 100% cotton, Kona cotton, Elkhide, more Elkhide, saddle grade leather, vegetable tan leather, bubble gum material, and the crazy eight layers of upholstery material. So between this little bit of off camera sewing that I'll put on the bottom, this is what we've done on the live stream today to put this machine to the final test before I prepare it for shipment to go out to Washington State. This is the real deal. This is what a machine should be put through before that individual considers the machine to be ready. You got to do it. You just got to do it. Yeah. Trying to see if I want to do anything else on this live stream for you. I just don't know what else I can show you, to be honest with you. Well, why don't we... Why don't we wrap this up? Why don't we wrap this up? If there's if there's nothing else that I can think of that we can test the machine with right now, then we can just go ahead and wrap this up. It looks like we've been running about an hour and 30 minutes already. And that's actually longer than I planned to go, but we had a couple of pauses uh, with Christy popping into the workshop from Illinois. So, but again, be a smart consumer. Don't assume that if you come across the 201-2, that it's going to be able to do what you saw this machine do today. This machine went through an incredible preparation process, you know, and you know what I'll do? Cause, cause I, we don't have time really to do it right now is I'll post the links for all of the progress shots that I did in the description. So you'll be able to see all of these pictures of the motor work and everything else that was done to this machine to get it ready for this premiere today. I'll just point out real quick, that's, that's actually rubber from the wiring that actually melted to the body the pillar of the machine. <clears throat> and that type of wiring that you're seeing right there <clears throat> is pretty common with potted motors. And that's on the bottom of the machine where you would never see it. And that also extends into the motor as well. So that's where I say buyer beware. 
if the machine doesn't come through the workshop, you don't know what you're going to get, and you might well be inheriting something like this. So, so again, remember, please, to remember to keep uh, uh, remember to keep Andy Tube. There we am. Remember to keep uh, Andy Tube uh, in your thoughts and prayers. Uh, he's taken a really bad turn uh, from a health standpoint. And uh, if you want to go to his channel, you can see the latest, <coughs> excuse me, video that he posted. Again, he's not talking. He just has some text updates on there talking about um, the fact that he, he's probably stepping away for good now from uh, his channel. So uh, keep him in thought, would you? And uh, I'm going to get back to work on this 101 on the other workbench. Yeah. Take care, everybody. Bye. Oh, bad bulb. That doesn't happen often. Thank you. 